purpose that we have. And in fact, uh, today that's very important for the Army and culture as a whole because, oh, the map's not up there. Well, maybe, that's okay, I'll use this one, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, you all know where uh, historical Armenia, as we call it, the Highlands. Uh, he'll put it up there on the map too. Uh, pretty much everyone that came to the Fresno area 150, 160 years ago was what we call Western uh, yeah. Armenia, historical Armenia. Van, Mush, Bitlis, you know, er Erzurum, Uh Well, after the massacre, there was no one left there, right? They were all killed or deported. So the heritage that we have inherited here, the Western Armenian tradition, isn't being replenished. And worldwide, that has been recognized by institutions such as the uh, United Nations, who have put Western Armenian language on the endangered language uh, list. Uh, Hayastan, Green Armenia, they've uh, established commissions to work on how to preserve Western Armenian culture. Uh, we're not that different from the Eastern Armenian. We're all Armenian, but we have our own unique uh, foods, the flavorings, the languages, and, and systems. So it's very interesting now. It's become the rage within the Armenian community to save the Western culture, the Armenian culture. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're here for. And so we're really excited with the Conservancy. Uh, we have many activities that we uh, have been undertaking, this being one of them. This is our second Family History Night, uh, where it's not just the person, individual story, but it's the family story. Because with the family story, we get the greater uh, connections. And that's what's the most important, is making the connections. You can have all types of facts about Armenians, 301, 451, uh, Ararat, and this and that, and all these names, but they don't mean anything unless you connect them. And the families and the names that we're connecting here Already with one of our presenters, I've, I went to school with one of the cousins. I knew another one from, uh, another was a teacher of mine. So, I mean, it's really neat to be able to make those connections. Uh, in addition, we've had presentations on Armenian food. Uh, we've had a, an Armenian uh, artist who lived in Fresno, uh, Mr. Baroyan. We had a, a show of his work. Uh, we have many other projects in the future. Uh, we're very excited. We do have an office. We're located in the vineyards at the... Uh, Armenian home, California Armenian home. Uh, we have partial hours. We're not there all the time, but we, if you take our <coughs> newsletter, there's information about our uh, physical address and our phone number and email. And please contact us. We do send out a quarterly newsletter with information about our activities. We also send out uh, emails to let you know about upcoming activities. So in uh, September, we have our annual fundraising event that's, uh, that will be coming up. So we hope that you'll be excited as we are for that. So are we all ready to hear some family history tonight, you guys? Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's, it's, that's great. Well, we have two presenters uh, today, and um, they will each tell their uh, stories, and then we'll have, uh, have the opportunity for questions, so I'm sure they'll be happy to do that. Our first presenter is going to be Alan McMullion. Alan, come on up and uh, introduce yourself to everyone. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, This was a very difficult thing to do. Uh, the people I'm going to be talking about were my grandparents. They raised me. My grandfather, Ardash, and my grandmother, Martin. Uh, I'm going to start towards the end, so you, and then I'll bring it all in together. No one in my family has ever done any research on our history or genealogy or what happened in the, uh, in the genocide. <clears throat> My grandfather was an alcoholic. He had his moments, he had his demons. But I loved him greatly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. My grandfather... Close. Like, close. Like you're getting yeah, I think yeah. you can close. Okay. Now? No. No, no. it's not working. Hello, can I tell you? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was not turned on. <clears throat> As I was saying, uh, my grandfather and I were very close. Uh, 
he took me a lot of places when I was a kid, and he used to take me to places that were normally normal people don't go. Uh, my grandfather was a person that um, his ethnicity was very important, and also all the countries he's ever been is is merged with the people that he intermingled inter 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 with. Uh, an, ex an example is I was a little kid. There was a little quarters where the Russians used to live. <clears throat> and on Saturday nights, they would play their music and drink their vodka. My grandfather would go along and join with them. That kind of thing that happened. Because in those days, there was no television. The only entertainment you had is you either visited people or people came over your house, and that's how things happened. Or you went to a picnic area, and I'll explain that uh, on, the, on one of the slides. So my grandfather, I was 14 years old, and my grandfather had a stroke. This is the 1960. In September of 1960, I, uh, I said, Heidi, I want to ask you some questions, and uh, I'd like you to be honest with me. He says, what is it? I said, why did you drink? And he says, <clears throat> I drink because I want to forget. I see this constant image in my face, in front of me, and I'm having nightmares. And I drink to forget. So <clears throat> let's go to the air's room. This is where my grandfather's from. Actually, he's from the town called Kogi. <coughs> so when you said Kogi to most people, they'd say, where is that? So you say Air's room, so that pretty much gives you a general idea where, uh, where he came from. He, um, he was born in 1898, and <clears throat> that cigarette, that's, his, uh, <laughs> that's the way he was. He didn't care whether people liked smoking or not. He smoked, he did whatever he wanted to do. So, <clears throat> When um, the massacre, that's what the nightmares were about. When they came and took his father, he was not, he was not at home. Two days later, they came and took his mother, his younger brother, and him. And they marched them, the Turks. They marched them to this out of town. And uh, two days later, they found a ravine where the Turks started to massacre the Armenians. My grandfather's mother was pregnant at the time, and the Turks wanted to play this game to see what kind of a child she had. They cut her open, and the blood splattered all over my grandfather's face, and he passed out and fell in a ravine. And then they killed his little brother as well. Um, Three or four hours later, he had awakened from this nightmare and hid in the forest. And he stayed there until he, he, uh, he found a way that he could walk out and be safe someplace. And he came across about four Armenian rebel fighters. And uh, he joined up with them and they asked him, um, they told him this, by the way, the Russian columns are coming we're, th we're going to join the Russians to fight the Turks because we can't, the four of us can't fight them. Yet. So they joined the Russian four days, two, three days later, the Russian column came and they joined the Russian column. My grandfather joined the Russian army at that time. From that time till 1917, he was in the Russian army and he, he mastered the language. And he, uh, from what I understand, that uh, he was, uh, he was not afraid of anything. He was very courageous, was someone that had told me. Uh, when my grandfather used to talk with his friends, uh, they used to talk about uh, in Turkish so that I would understand about the, the conquest and the things that they've done. So <clears throat> when they joined the Russian army, in 1917, the Russians had a revolution. So his dream to go to Russia was pretty much over. He says, no, I'm not going to go to Russia. I'm going to go uh, to Halep and see if I can find 
members of my family or cousins or relatives. So when he went to he went to Halep and then uh, through the Red Cross, he found out that his brother was in America uh, and was who was looking for him, any one of his family whether they were alive or not. So they made contact, and his brother from America sent him a ticket passage to France so that he could take the boat from France, Marseille, to America. So he made the journey from Halep to uh, France. And at that time, <clears throat> uh, he was looking for friends that he had known or someone he might recognize. And he had found three other friends of his, which I will show you in the next in the picture that uh, will uh, tie in some of the, uh, the contacts. So when my grandfather moved to France, he became, a, a, he worked in construction. He was good, he was working for a big company and he made good money at that time. So he was a sharp dresser, a good looking guy. And uh, he met my grandmother. And uh, the dream coming to America pretty much ended. So, now I'm going to go to uh, my grandmother's side. My grandmother's na his name was Vartanush Kalustya. She was born in Adyaman, Turkey. Uh, it's a uh, lot of people, it's, no, it's normally not shown on the map, but the city today has about 300,000 inhabitants. And there's room, I think, today has 500,000. So, this is the story about my grandmother, Vartanush Kalus. When <clears throat> my grandmother had um, three, uh, three sisters and one brother. And uh, when they took her parents, uh, she was not at home. She was playing with some kids uh, someplace in the wood. And when she came, they, the, the Turks had taken her parents, and when she came home, there was no one there. So the Turkish family that lived two doors down took her in and uh, wait and took care of her till her older sister, Anna, would come to get her. So her older sister, Anna, who was forced into marrying a Turk, um, an older guy, and uh, she came and found my grandmother and took her and with her to another part of the town that she lived. So my grandmother's uh, <clears throat> oldest sister, Anna, which saved her, and next to her, there was a young, another daughter, Anna, Anaid. Anaid had, was, from what my grandma used to say, she was very beautiful. Um, she was about 18 years old, and the Turks came and took her as well. They didn't kill her from what she knows, but someone uh, took her away. So when my grandmother uh, he, um, moved in with my, uh, her older sister, and um, the Turk guy, her husband, took care of my grandmother, and um, so for the duration, they were trying to hide her, because they knew that the, this Turkish guy and her didn't have any kids, so it was dangerous for her to, to show that they had a, all of a sudden a kid appears. So my grandma, my, uh, my, I should say my grandmother's sister found a Turkish family that needed some uh, a maid to take care of the kids. And that's where she placed her. When my uh, grandmother's sister's husband passed, because he was an elderly guy, she took her sister, my grandmother, and through the night, we made their way to Halep. So when they were going to Halep, there was an old elderly gentleman that said to her, look, I know the way, and I'll, you stay with me, and I'll show you how to get to Halep in safety. So when they uh, marching, during the day, they would uh, hide, and during the night, they would walk. So along this river, they came in, saw this Armenian girl who was very thin, um, <coughs> Very, she was tattooed all over, and she had lice. So uh, my grandmother says to her sister, "Can we take her with us?" And my uh, grandmother's sister said, "Yes." So they took her with them. 
but it, she didn't have long to live because as my grandmother was telling me the story, she was very emotional. So anyways, this young girl died and she said, the horrible scene that I remember is all the blood and the dead bodies in the river. She said, I never see so many people floating. I never, she says, uh, it was very painful and difficult for me. So anyways, they made it to Havoc, but my, uh, my grandmother's sister placed her in an orphanage because she said they had no means to survive. She didn't have a job. They just got there. So she wanted to find work, and, and she wanted to make sure my grandma was safe in, in an orphanage. <clears throat> so by then, a, uh, an Armenian-Canadian family from uh, Bradford, Canada, wanted to adopt my grandmother. And they sent the papers uh, and ticket for her to come to Canada. So from Halep, the normal route was from Halep to Marseille, Marseille to the U.S. That's the only way you travel. And there was no other means. That, uh, uh, so this is where they had to go. So when she got in France, she was 15 years old. And uh, she met my grandfather. And in France, you can't get married. On, you're underage. So they changed her birth certificate to 1905 to make her 17. And she married my grandfather. <laughs> so <clears throat> they had a they had a family, they had uh, four kids. The eldest was my mother, uh, the second was my uncle, Antranik, and the next was Angelina, who died after one year, a year as a patient. She caught an infection, and the youngest was my uncle, Paul. So, <clears throat> growing up, I did not grow up with a normal life, Another meaning that I was around, surrounded by elderly people. What I learned was from these elderly people. When they would talk about the, the old country, they would never talk in Armenian, they always talk in Turkish to hide things from me. But I understood some parts and I knew what they were talking about. So I collected all this data in my head. So as the years went by from living in France till we came to the States in the 50s, I remember all these things. And I remember all these things when we came to America and listening to my grandfather talking to his brother. Now, uh, in 19, uh, uh, in 1940, when France was occupied by the Nazis, my grandparents were due, they were due to come to the United States. Of course, the night when the Germans came in, nothing happened. Nobody traveled. It was everything was frozen. They took my grandfather to a German labor camp. We kept them there for the duration of the war. When the Americans liberated the camps, they released him and expatriated him to France. And from there, in, in the 40s, my uh, uncle who lived in America, uh, I should say, my grandfather's brother, who came to America in 1908, he was 13 years old, and he had established himself. He sponsored my uncle, <clears throat> Antony, to come to America. He came to America in 1950, and in 1952, he brought his brother, Paul. In 1958, he brought me, my grandmother, and my grandfather. My grandfather only lived two and a half years before he passed. Now, um, this is in France. This is the... Uh, the people in the back, the gentlemen in the back, are all uh, Kovetsis, I should say, from the same village as my grandfather. He connected with them in Marseille, and they became lifetime friends until they left to come to America. The ladies in the front, the one on, with the, uh, the, the collar here, uh, with the white belt, that's my grandmother. The lady on the left is a good friend of my grandmother. Her, my grandmother, and that lady survived World War II by doing black marketing because my grandfather was taken to a labor camp. There was no money coming in. So black market, what, what does that mean? It means that they used to take their backpack and go to the farmhouses, buy eggs, buy butter, and sell it in order to, and then eat whatever they could and sell the rest, which was against French laws. You can't do black marketing. Uh, those two ladies 
my grandmother and that lady there next to her were born in Mexico, let you go. So they had another chance. That gentleman on top next to my grandfather is Baron Carustian, and the guy on the left with the finger pointing to my grandfather is, is Arbopian, Alexander Arbopian. And the lady on the uh, lower, uh, to my right, is his wife. There was Mutt and Jeff. And they had a daughter. The daughter was nine years old, eight years old. And this place where that photograph was taken is where all the Armenian used to gather. It was like a, like the old age on a picnic area where they had Olympic swimming pools, uh, you had barbecues, you had a nightclub, you had all kinds of, this is where the Armenian con congregated during the weekend. And me and this young girl, uh, we got lost. And uh, two cops uh, saw us by ourselves and they said, where are you going? I said, uh, she said, I don't know, but this, this boy got me lost. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally he says, where are your parents? He, and uh, we don't remember. So anyways, he took us to, to that place. And the first thing she says to her mother, as pissed on in the cousin <laughs> She says, this bad boy got me lost. It's all his fault. <laughs> but they were lifetime friends. And they also, they also worked together in construction, all three of them. So they worked for a big company that, uh, well, after the war, they were building a lot of these houses that had been demolished by the bombs. Now, this is the kingpin. Solomon Ekmalian was my grandfather's older brother. He was three years older than my, uh, my grandfather. Um, in 1908, he left there as a room to come to America. He was 13 years old. I, saw, I had to manifest on a ship that he was in, and um, he came to a place called Troy, New York, where he, like every Armenian who came in, you know, uh, pay their dues and did whatever the kid do to survive. But he, he became very successful. He was a, um, he made shaving brushes for the United States Army. So during World War II, uh, he was supplied the United States Army with shaving brushes. So he was a well-to-do man. And um, his, he had not seen my grandfather in 50 years. So when they saw each other, This is the, when we landed in New York. And this is me, my grandmother made me this jacket. <laughs> my, grandmother, uh, my grandmother to my right, and to the back, the, this gentleman is his son, and the lady and behind me is his wife, and the lady behind my grandfather is uh, my uncle's wife. They went and got the car, and of uh, course my grandfather. So it was a happy occasion. I mean, uh, you've never seen stuff hugging and all that stuff. I mean, they talk about the old country and, and what they did the last time they saw each other. So uh, we, uh, in fact, um, this is <coughs> this is my grandfather's passport. He did not have a French passport because he was not a citizen of France, and nor he applied to be a citizen. But it was a uh, a passport, and because I'm, I was underage, I had to get with my grandfather on the passport. This is in 1958. Uh, so, I haven't changed much. <laughs> <laughs> my grandfather died in 1950, uh, 1960 of a stroke. Um, this is the last picture of him before he passed. The guy holding the pot. Uh, my, right here, my, this, my best friend, level one. I didn't speak English, and he was my translator. So whatever, we went to school together, and, and he would tr uh, translate everything that I needed to know. This is my uncle Antoni. He, he was like a father to me. He, uh, he helped raise me financially, <coughs> sent me to school, and uh, my grandmother's right arm because he. He was a great human being. 
and then there's me in between my grandmother and my uncle, and then uh, the other lady, the two ladies, the mother and daughter, and this is their son, and this is uh, her husband on top, and their grandparents, and then the other brother. So, um, yes. Alan, is that Eddie on the top right? No, Eddie, Eddie is, uh, let me show you. Looks like him. Eddie, Eddie's right there. Right yeah. between my grandmother and the top left. Okay. Yeah. That's Eddie. By the way, Mike knows my family from back east because he used to live there. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, this is the last picture taken of my grandfather when he passed. And this is the last picture of my grandmother. Uh, worked on the Shu Christian who uh, lived in Fresno and uh, was the reason why I moved to Fresno and this is where I met my wife. So if there's any question I'll be more than happy to answer. Um, taken 
circa 1918 in Selma, California, on Peter Thompson's ranch. Who the heck is Peter Thompson? Doesn't sound Armenian. His, his name was Bedro, Bedro Spalutsian. And he changed it to Peter Thompson um, after they came. So that's a whole lot of people. That's 52 Palutians. And some Bartons in there too, right? This slide is of, um, from the book. It has genealogies for all of the families that were from the village. Um, but they're kind of hard to make out because they don't really, um, if you see where it says Palutsvank, that's our name. And then it just gives the first name of the men. And it doesn't say anything about the wives or the sisters. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, but we use this, I use this um, with help of my family and other people to reconstruct uh, members of our family that we didn't really know anything about and help to identify um, pictures that we had. And then I've been working on this ever since and so I've gathered a lot of materials and I have my blog and um, have managed to capture people um, and get information from them. So um, this is Hovanas Palutsian. He was the first to come to the United States. He was born in 1862, and um, he arrived in 1888. Um, so this is even before the Hamidian massacres. So I think it was a time when um, people were looking to come to America to make something for them, for, of themselves. And I know there were a lot of missionaries in that area at the time that made connections um, between Armenians and people in the U.S. and help them find work and a lot of them worked in um, industries on, um, in Massachusetts and New Jersey. And he came, like I said, in 1888 and then at some point he returned to Turkey, was married to someone by the last name of Atanian and had a daughter, Makrui, um, who was born in 1896. Then he came back to the U.S in 1901, and he was here for two years, and then he left again in <coughs> September 1903, and he arrived in France on September 11th, 1903. From that point, he made his way to Athens, Greece. Um, I have a document, his um, emergency passport um, from Athens, and he applied for the U.S. passport on uh, the 26th of September, 1903, and then um, by November, he was returning to the United States with a Greek wife, <laughs> who he must have met there. Her name was Ephrosini. And um, their first son was born in the US in 1904. So this is the next Palutzian to come to the US. This is Bedros Palutzian, also known as Peter Thompson. This is the earliest picture of him. So this must have been about the time that he came. He looks very young. Um, he was born in 1874, and he arrived um, in Massachusetts on uh, the 25th of May, 1891. And he met his wife, Mabel, and married her in Massachusetts. And this next picture is of their family, much later. Very handsome family, it's a beautiful picture. So Havanas and Bedros are brothers. And then, um, the next is Tumas, who's also known as Thomas. Um, he was a cousin to Bedros and Havanas. And his father's name was um, Garabet. And so when he traveled, um, his name on the ship manifest is Tumas Garabedian. Um, but then when he got to the United States, he started going by Tomas or Thomas Palutzian. And he also, I didn't make a note. I can't remember if he met his wife before or after he came. I think after. This is Yulubur, or Agda Hagopian. She was, we're not sure. We've done 
DNA were related. Uh, um, she was not a, a sister to Holvana or Bedros. She was probably a cousin. Um, but her mother's last name was Polizian, maybe. Her father's name is Hagopian. But um, sometimes during that time period, they didn't use last names the way we did. And they would sometimes go by their father's first name as their last name. So if his name was Hago Polizian, she still could have gone by Hago Um Kind of hard to tell, but there's not many records that would give us that information. But she traveled with her husband. She was born in 1880, and she traveled with her husband, Charles Barton, um, who also went by Garved Aristogazian, and they arrived in 1899. And they traveled as Agda and Garved back to Syria, because his father's name was uh, Agda. And that's their family. This is Manu. This is my great great grandfather. And this is his second wife, Marion. His first wife um, died sometime before they came to the United States. And uh, his son, Tadavos, was my great grandfather. Manu was born in 1861, um, Tadavos was born in 1882. Um, in 1901, the both of them arrived with Monik's wife, Miriam, and their daughter, Pearl. Um, and then after they arrived, um, so Pearl's the, the oldest daughter there, and then there's Harry, Harold, and Lucille. <laughs> this is Tadavos' family. Well, it's, that's Tadavos there on the uh, second from the left. And that's his wife, Duvar, and her family, her parents. Tatoyan. Huh? Tatoyan. Tatoyan. and um, what was her name? Uh, I know, I'm the one that's supposed to know. <laughs> but that's Tatoyan, and then their, um, other, their daughter, Debbie, was actually 10 years younger than Duvar. And then 10 years later, they had another daughter. So they were all 10 years apart. Um, they arrived, um, I don't have that on this list because they're not losing, but Todd of us arrived with his uh, father. Then this next slide is Kashador. He was another brother to Manu, Bedros, and Nalanus. And that's him with his wife Beatrice and their family. They arrived in 1906 together. And all of their children were born in the United States. They married right before they yeah. came over. This is Harton Pelutsian. I don't have a very good, that's the only picture I have of him. I know of his family, um, but I haven't made close enough contact to get pictures from them. Um, so he shows up in the group photo. And he was a cousin, and he arrived um, on the 22nd of June, 1913. Um, and he arrived by himself, and he later married. And so all of these family members stayed in the Fresno County area, more or less. So there they are again. I've added all their names. And so they had all arrived for, uh, before the massacres in 1915. So this whole family survived because they were willing to travel or they had the foresight or the warning to get up and move so far away.
Uh, if you are interested in genealogy and finding out more about your family, um, finding arrival records or uh, military records, um, I put together a little list of resources. I put some copies on the back table. Um, but if, you, if there's not enough copies or you want more information, you can email me and I can send you a copy or send you more information. Um, but I use the uh, website Ancestry.com to do a lot of my genealogical research. There's also other websites like FamilySearch.org, um, uh, org. They've published a book, and um, their uh, project is to reconstruct Ottoman Armenian town and village life. So it's kind of like the same um, goals as this group to talk about Western. Armenia and preserve the culture and the history of the peoples from those area. There's also a great face group book that's um, just Armenian genealogy and there's a lot of great resources there, a lot of very knowledgeable people, people who travel to Western Armenia, people who write for um, books and magazines, work at universities, who have a lot of um, great things to share. And then Don had asked about the software I use. Um, so in conjunction with Ancestry, I use Family Tree Maker. Um, and they work together so you can upload and download between them. It automatically updates. And that way you have a record of your work offline, plus you have all of the resources online. That's all I have for you today. But I, I'd be happy to take any questions. Last family picture back up on the screen. Arabs, 
Greeks, Italian, Spaniards, French, and Armenians. I picked up the, my, most of the languages, I could speak them. But when I came to America, I totally forgot. But I, used, I could speak Turkish, I understand some of it, especially when you're talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I totally lost the skills. I'm even afraid because uh, uh, I'm fluent in French, and if I don't speak to Virginia sometimes, I'm, I forget it. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> Uh, Roosevelt, well, McLean, Roosevelt High School, mm -hmm. McLean and, and Bullard. But my, my biggest question, though, it's really interesting to me, the forbidden language sticks with you. And my mother and her sister spoke Italian when it was a secret. And did I perk up and listen? Yes. And it, it, it helped me later when I was studying. I'm sure it got embedded in there because I knew that if I could listen and figure it out, I would know things I wasn't supposed to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the other day I went out to breakfast with some friends, and we're sitting at a table right in the back of us. Uh, I said to my friend, I said, Ron, are they speaking French? He says, uh, let, wait, let me hear. And he says, yes. So he, he says to the people, uh, are you French? They said, we, we are, we are. So then, then we start talking the conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, small world this is, this Armenian guy was born here, and when he was 13, he moved to France, Marseille. He met a French girl who was from the same village as my mother, where resides now. And she says, oh, I'm very familiar with the town your mom lives. So we start, but the more we talk, because the name was Dorman, okay, I said, uh, Excuse me, but what are you doing in Fresno? Are you, is your husband? Uh, I asked her husband in French, are you, uh, which ethnicity are you? He said, I'm Armenian. We changed our name to Dharma. They're related uh, to Dr. Pulisari. So they live off a highway, uh, off Fryer Road. But we had a nice conversation. Um, they, he has children, he had children in France, and they came to visit them, the mother and father here. So they were here for 20 some odd days. So. But no matter where I go, whether it's Italian, Spanish, Armenian, or even Turkish, I interject and say, hey, you know. You can eavesdrop. Yes. yes. So what do you think the percentage now of Armenians in France is? And is there an Armenian? Armenians in France are very strong. Um, <clears throat> they're highly motivated as far as being a uh, Armenian and they can maintain the culture. Uh, in France, Armenians have a great name. As you know, Aznavour is a national hero. Sure. And uh, Sylvia, uh, Sylvia, uh, I forgot the last name, but Sylvia Vartan uh, is another one. So <coughs> Armenians, uh, Armenians in France are prominent in, in, in the various fields. Medicine, uh, when I go to um, Every year I go on a medical mission to Armenia. And when I go to Artsakh especially, there's a team of French doctors who are there. Every, the same time that we're there, and they, they, they're, they're French Armenian. And some are not French, uh, they are not Armenian, they're French. So same as us, we have American doctors and have Armenian doctors who go on this mission. So it's a, when we see them at, at the, uh, the Republic Square, you know, we greet each other. So every year we see them, they, you know, it's like a big family. <clears throat> but Armenians have a great name in, uh, in France. Uh, not so much as in LA. <laughs> 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 it's a bad name in LA. <laughs> What, what is the level of teaching of Armenian now? Or is anybody speaking it below, say, the generation of? No, I'm afraid that my generation is the last. Because the new generation don't, unless their grandparents teach them or force them to speak. But uh, my, I'll give you an example. My cousins, 
that have Armenian name, but they're half Armenian and half are Canadian. But they said, the only thing Armenian about me is my, my name, that's uh -huh. all. So none of them were interested in this story. I did a, couldn't care less. You know, this is in the past. This is what they said. This is in the past. I'm more interested in the future. But if you don't know your past, you, you don't have a good future. You don't have a future. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, you know. Thank but you. Mike mentioned that you're familiar with the Armenian Studies program at Fresno State. Sure. That they have an excellent language program. So kids that are interested, they learn quite a bit there. The, the only Armenian that's spoken are the Eastern Armenians from Armenia who come here. They still maintain the language. But for me to understand them is very that's difficult. It's a different dialect. They understand me, but I don't understand that. Uh, other than the basic, you know, uh, water, bread, or on OG, or, you know, Food. they understand that. But you, I could not carry a conversation. So are they like split dialects or different languages? Well, there are three dialects in Armenian. There's a Russian dialect, there's a Eastern Armenian dialect, and there's a Persian dialect. Those three are pretty much in common. But the Turkish Armenian, when I say Turkish Armenian, because of my heritage came from Turkey, it's totally different. My Armenian and people from Beirut, they understand, we understand each other. Some of the words are the same because they're also victims of the genocide who moved to the Middle East. So we understand each other. But Turkish Armenian background and Eastern Armenian I have a problem on this. That's that's another lecture to pull down. Let's talk about that one. Before you before you guys go and make sure you go in the back, we have displays. Uh, we're working on a project to save the Vartanian house. 120 year old house built for uh, Obaki Vartanian in Fresno in 1894. Uh, it's slated to be demolished unless we can find a new home for it. We have the story, the, uh, the history, pictures back there. Please become familiar with it. You'll be hearing more as our efforts continue to save, save the house. Final thing is a poll question for you P O L L. Uh, since our offices are located at the vineyards at the Armenian home, we have access to the AACL hall there. And, uh, many of you might be familiar, it's a very large uh, hall with uh, the facilities. If we were to have these activities there, uh, let's do show of hands or voice. Uh, would there be any difficulty? How many would you would like to, would, have, would there be any problem if we attended, if we had the activities there? How many would go if we had them there? Where's there? At the Armenian home. <laughs> we have the facilities there. And how many would, would say would prefer uh, the library since so you have like to come in here? Okay. We have a, how about either? Yeah, there you go. Well, we'd like to mix it up since, since we are closely associated with the home. We have had activities. We had a movie night for the residents. And, and if we have other activities like this, we'd like to have it. Thank you again. Hopefully uh, you guys can interact. We'll take a look at the, uh, the uh, displays and we'll see you at our next one. Yes, yeah, so are you going to volunteer?